Hello everyone, welcome to PlayStation Access. My name is Ash, and today you can find me scrubbing blood out of my favourite assassin's hood and picking hay out of places where there really shouldn't be hay. In other words, I've been playing Assassin's Creed Mirage, though this is no desert illusion. We have gone hands-on with the early hours of the game and have a lot to get through. So, I'd like to formally invite you on our tour of 9th century Baghdad. We're actually going back in time in more ways than one, not just winding the clock back to 861, but also to 2007. Assassin's Creed Mirage is a return to the basics of Assassin's Creed 1, back when urban stealth was all the craze and the game was not an open-world RPG. Unless it stood for ruining people's gullets, which we definitely did do. Of course, Mirage incorporates all the lessons learned in the last 15 years of skulking and stabbing, but there's a definite sense of Basim's adventure channeling a different era. So, in this video, let's look at seven ways Assassin's Creed Mirage is a return to classic creed. Number 1. You play as a proper assassin. Technically, Basim, our hero, is a hidden one. The organization slowly stabbing their way towards becoming the Brotherhood, but he's much more of an al than the raging barbarians of the recent games. When you first meet him, he's a street rat who pilfers from pockets and legs it to the rooftops when the pockets owner realizes what he's done. In my day, getting caught stealing meant being banned from the local Tesco. Basim gets enlisted at the Alimet Academy for very sneaky boys and taught to throw himself off cliffs. Yes, master! Maybe exams were harder back in the day. This whole section is like being in your very own Batman Begins training montage as you learn knife throwing, sword fighting, rock climbing, and some light bushwork. If you love the sequences in the earlier creeds where you get taught the shadowy basics, this really hits the spot. Particular shout out to grumpy tutor Rashan, voiced by Shurei Agdashlu from The Expanse. <laughs> that took me by surprise. Much scarier than Batman's Liam Neeson, but she gets results. The Basim who leaves is a much more capable assassin. Number two, Basim moves like a capable assassin. The moment you pick up the pad, you sense that he is built for speed. Up on the rooftops, parkour is the nimblest it's been since Assassin's Creed Unity. You dive through windows, swing on crane arms, and use springy poles to boing over the wider streets below. Honestly, moving from Ivor to Basim is like swapping a bus for a motorbike, or to be more period accurate, swapping a camel with a very big hump for a camel with a very aerodynamic hump. Listen, I don't watch camel top gear. At the same time, you now need to put more thought into climbing. In Valhalla, you could have pointed Ivor at Everest, held R2, and sprinted to the summit. Basim relies on hand grips to climb up surfaces, and in this way it takes us back to Assassin's Creed 2, where climbing felt more like a puzzle. You look up at these towering Baghdad structures and have to mentally plot a route before committing. If you try to lazily make it across the city as the crow flies, you'll end up hanging from weird ledges with nowhere to go. And here it is demonstrated in the most thrilling game capture you'll see in 2023. <laughs> Adding to this careful climbing is the way buildings keep you locked out. Doors and windows are often barred from the inside, limiting points of entry until you properly climb around the exterior and maybe discover a window you could throw a knife through or a useful hole in the ceiling. Or just go through the front door and have a really messy fight. The city is much less willing to give up its treasures, and so successes feel juicier as a result. Number 3. Intimate navigation is befitting a more intimate city. Say goodbye to acres upon acres of free-roaming English mud, and hello to the tight urban sprawl of Baghdad, streets that instantly whisk us back to the first game's Jerusalem or Revelation's Constantinople. But it's a city with a little bit more going on under the hood, if you'll forgive the pun. For starters, there are tales of Baghdad, which are a lot like Valhalla's world events, and if you're not familiar with those, they were a lot like Red Dead Redemption's random encounters. Think quirky little side stories you stumble into, often solved in a few minutes but adding a dash of colour. In one, we helped a boy pluck up the courage to leap from a tower, great role model, and gained a skill point for our efforts. Sometimes it does pay to be an irresponsible adult. But if you do get up to no good, Baghdad remembers. Prying eyes are everywhere. Do something bad in plain sight and citizens report your actions and increase your wanted level in the city. 
Raise it a little bit and common guards are suddenly more diligent. Further badness places archers on rooftops or introduces elite soldiers into the population. Gradually, you'll feel yourself being penned in. Even your poor bird and kiddo suffers for it, as archers will shoot out of the sky if they see us spying from above. The solution, apart from playing as a saint, which we definitely didn't, is to tear down wanted posters or pay bribes to lower the heat. But even with this, you're always slightly on edge. On the flip side, Baghdad operates a favor economy, where you trade Kidma tokens with different factions for their help. Merchant tokens can be swapped for a shop discount, perhaps, or handed over to information brokers to get more intel on your current mission. Tell me what you know. Find a scholar token and you can employ musicians to attract guards, while rebel tokens can be used to pay bribes. To earn this goodwill in the first place and load up with tokens, you complete contracts, your traditional side missions, or do the less honorable thing and pick some pockets. This is a simple but satisfying minigame where you hit the button just as the shapes align. The richer the pocket, the smaller the slot. Mess up the minigame and, well, see the previous point about wanted systems. What we love about all of this is how it gives the city a better sense of a population, one that remembers you at your worst, but can also reward you for your civic pride. These social systems would have blown our minds back in 2007. Assassin's Creed is a stealth game at heart, but one that has, in the last few games, also embraced a less stealthy pastimes, such as all-out Grecian warfare and shouting Rah! while running into monasteries and killing every monk in England. Three hours with Mirage and we have killed zero vicars! In fact, we've spent most of those hours squatting in bushes, whistling at confused security guards. This should be Hoodlum 101. Never trust a whistling shrubbery. Which is to say that, like classic Creed, Mirage goes big on going small. Basim is capable with a sword and parrying dagger, but hand-to-hand -hand combat feels deliberately stripped down to encourage a calmer approach. Your attack, parry, and dodge are limited by a relatively strict stamina gauge that easily sees you overwhelmed if you tackle a small army at once. There's also none of the hand axes, grappling hooks, and attack dogs that Ivor keeps on him somehow. Here, it's parry or bust. While you definitely spend less time thinking about armed combat in Mirage, there still is an upgrade system, but it feels even more minimized than Valhalla's, which had itself already streamlined Odysseys. Materials stolen from the city can boost damage or defensive parry damage, but we didn't see anything in our preview to suggest you'd get lost in hours of stat tweaking or equipment looting. But hey, who needs stats when you're steering an apex predator like Basim? <laughs> Whistling to lure guards into the shadows lets you pick off stragglers as it always has, but also charges up his focus bar in the bottom left, which unlocks one of the coolest additions in Assassin's Creed history. Hold in the right stick and focus mode lets you select three targets to assassinate in a flowing chain of liquid death. Yep, okay, I love it. It is cool as hell and is really useful. That room with two guards in each of the sight lines, not a problem. Two clicks and they're gone. Or how about an assassination target hiding away on a rooftop with two friends? On our first focus free attempt, it ended up with Basim doing his best impression of a pop up pirate, swords in him from every angle. The second time, we flew up on a crane, activated focus, and sliced them up before they even had a chance to react. It feels like a descendant of Splinter Cell's mark and execute ability, although I guess the timeline makes it an ancestor? Either way, just as Sam Fisher's instant headshots were recharged by doing a riskier takedown, the focus move requires regular assassinations to refuel. It stops the game becoming a walk in the park and really makes you think about the best time to deploy the power. Okay, focus assassinations weren't in classic Creed, but it feels like something Altair would really be on board with. Perhaps the biggest callback to classic Creed are the assassinations themselves. Though mild spoilers could follow here, I'm going to carefully avoid revealing the identity of the target we hunted in our preview, both for story reasons and because a big part of Mirage is the investigation that leads up to finally taking that life. If you think back to 2007, that might sound familiar. Altair needed to collect info on every hit before he was permitted to kill. Their motto should have been everything is permitted once you've done a whole load of eavesdropping. In Mirage, the preamble to murder is woven into a set piece. You find yourself in the bazaar, a beautiful covered market ripe with shop owners to quiz about your target. Some give info willingly, others can be bribed with tokens if you have them. Many clues unfold as side missions in themselves. Working out how to break into this shop to steal back an item for someone, say, or sneaking into a private guild to find a token to gain access to some inner sanctum. 
There's even a hint of Hitman to some of it. You can infiltrate an auction and bid on an item to get you closer to your target. Alas, we didn't have time to see how much the bizarre sequence could branch out, but it struck us as a delicious cocktail of past games. If you liked Syndicate and Unity's black box assassinations, you'll appreciate the narrative build-up to the kill. But it mixed that in with the social stealth of Assassin's Creed 1 and a few ideas of its own, like using the guild tokens to unlock different options. As the hidden blade popped out and did its thing, I was already thinking about ways it could have gone differently, and I can't wait to see more. Which is probably my general takeaway from the game then. I definitely want to see more of Assassin's Creed Mirage. Don't get me wrong, whilst the idea of 100 plus hours spent murdering our own ancestors in Assassin's Creed Valhalla is nice, the idea of a more contained, focused adventure, one that taps into skills we've not dusted off in a while, is incredibly appealing. You'll be able to dust off your own classic Creed reflexes when Mirage comes to PS5 on the 5th of October. Are you excited by the game's shift in direction? Let us know in the comments below. And while you're sneaking around down there under the video, why not also click the like button and subscribe to PlayStation Access for more videos on everything PlayStation. Thanks for watching. PlayStation.